Five misconceptions about populism. Number one, populism is right wing. It can be, but not necessarily so. The confusion arises when people conceive of populism as an ideology. Instead, it's best to see populism as a means of presenting an ideology, which can be both left wing and right wing. Populism itself is an elusive term, and often its usage implies a vague set of phenomena that are unquantifiable and unilluminating. Peter Wiles wrote in the 1960s that populism is a term used according to the academic acts of the speaker, although most broadly agree that populism focuses itself around a people and identifies good with a unified will of the people and evil with a conspiring elite. This often leads to rigid black and white divides between the virtuous common man and the corrupted establishment politicians. Both Five Star Movement of Italy and Podemos of Spain refer to the political establishment as the caste to illustrate this. Marine Le Pen of the Front National refers to other politicians as part of the UMPS, a neologism merging the names of the two French establishment parties. The Finns Party of Finland were formerly called the True Finns, illustrating how the party appeals to the normal, the common and the average. My personal favourite way of seeing populism is that defined by Cass Moudet, who wrote in 2004, Populism is a thin-centred ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. 2. Populism is a danger to democracy. From what we've seen, populism focuses solely around the mobilisation of the masses, and thus to call it undemocratic as a criticism seems a bit misplaced. One criticism that may be a bit more founded is the allegation that populism oversimplifies complex political phenomena which could have negative consequences. Scholar Paul Taggart argues along these lines, asserting that populism reduces complex empirical phenomena to irrational appeals to emotion for important decision making. One classic example of this can be seen in a populist preference for referendums. Some countries have referendums implemented as part of the political framework of the country. Switzerland is an example here, and thus very small populist parties have been able to make considerable political impact through launching citizens' initiatives without having strong electoral support. National Action in the late 60s launched a referendum against over-foreignization of the workforce, and although they were a very small party, they managed to gain a 46% vote in favour. Of course, more recent examples are the Brexit referendum, the Dutch referendum on Ukraine launched by the direct democracy outfit Hein Pale, and the constitutional reforms in Italy launched by Renzi and the PD, but hugely mobilised around by Five Star Movement. Another argument that can question the democratic integrity of populism can be levelled against its treatment of minorities, although this applies more to its right-wing strain. Crude majoritarianism can become a kind of tyranny of the majority, whereby minority rights are curtailed in favour of majority opinion. Debates around the welfare state are often framed around this issue, where the inclusion of immigrant populations in the social benefits of citizens is seen as undermining the rights of the majority who have to pay the costs. Another example could be the relationship the populist right has had with religious minorities. The Swiss ban on minarets, for example, could be construed as undermining the religious freedom of Swiss Muslims. Despite the above, I don't think this can constitute a lack of democracy. In fact, it can be seen as the opposite, maybe too much democracy. This certainly can be a criticism of populism, depending on your political beliefs. Populism is democracy without nuance. Perhaps, to put it in layman's terms, Populism is democracy on steroids. 3. Populists are a liability in government. I can understand where this comes from. The rhetoric of populism is bombastic, unconventional and often quite aggressive. The fear is that this will translate into poor and erratic governance, whether this be due to incompetence and or ill intention. This has translated into the policies of establishment parties, who in some instances have implemented cordon sanitaires to minimise the potential of populist actors, notable examples here being Belgium and Sweden. The thing is, empirically speaking, this view isn't supported. Populists have been in government throughout Europe, and it's hardly been a disaster, well, in most cases anyway. If anything, when this has happened, it's done well to quell their support. Currently, the Finns party are part of the Finnish government, the Norwegian Progress Party are part of the Norwegian government, the Swiss People's Party are a staple of Swiss politics and the biggest party in the country, the Danish People's Party are in a support role in Denmark, 
the FPO formed a coalition government in Austria in 2000, the Italian Lega Nord have been in coalition on more than one occasion in Italy, the PVV played a support role in the Netherlands in 2010, I could go on. To my knowledge, with the exception of the SVP, governmental inclusion of these parties has actually hindered their support rather than increased it. Many times the parties themselves are aware of this. Indeed, the party of Finns refused to enter government in 2011 as they recognised doing so would mean having to sacrifice core policy positions. In 2013, the Five Star Movement did the same. Kurt Wilders withdrew support from government in 2012 in light of austerity measures and possible Turkish EU ascension. And there are other examples too. This is because parties must follow a dual strategy in a democracy, especially one involving coalitions and proportional representation. A vote-seeking strategy, which seeks to maximise a party's vote share, but also an office-seeking strategy, which seeks to forge alliances with other political parties to make them possible and viable coalition partners. Both of these strategies often can be seen as having a moderating effect on policy, with each contradicting the other. For example, the PVV in the Netherlands has sought a solely vote-seeking strategy, which has worked well in making them the most popular party in the country, but has severely limited the party's coalition opportunities. Going into the 2017 election, it seems unlikely that they will be a part of government. On the opposite end of the spectrum, throughout the last decade, the Norwegian Progress Party has sought a primarily office-seeking strategy. This has resulted in a severe toning down of rhetoric, casting out the more extreme elements of the party, and policy concessions to demonstrate a willingness to work with the establishment. This has undermined the party's ability to obtain votes, but has ultimately resulted in the party entering government under a more moderate platform. Due to these factors, we can expect that the closer a party gets to government, the more it will tend to moderate. Of course, this is a generalisation, but one to bear in mind nonetheless. 4. Populism has roots in Nazism. I need not spend too much time on this. Some scholars have argued that populism is fascism with a new face. For example, Robert Paxton has posited that the West's general contempt for anything associated with Nazism has, through necessity, required fascism to overhaul its means of presentation, and the populist radical right has been a vehicle through which this has been achieved. The problem with this argument is it's unfalsifiable. It sees fascism, or Nazism, as a sort of ethereal spirit that subtly inclines movements to form under different guises. I mean, I could say the same with other parties and movements, and you'd struggle to prove me wrong. This is not to say that there aren't connections in some instances. The Sweden Democrats definitely have roots in neo-Nazism, but this hardly means that today the party is a crypto-Nazi outfit. Leader Jimmy Ockerson has gone through great lengths to expel any members exhibiting neo-Nazi sympathies. The Austrian FPO was fronted by former National Socialists throughout its early years, but the more traditional parties had many Nazis in their ranks too, as one would expect post-World War II. Moreover, back then the party's platform was small government liberalism, and not the nationalism we see today. They only became a populist radical right party under the leadership of Jörg Haider come 1986. Focusing on the populist left, Podemos in Spain, following the works of Ernesto Laclau, have repackaged old-school socialist and communist ideas through populism to increase general appeal. For more information, watch my video Who are Podemos? The equivalent of Paxton's argument would be me suggesting Podemos is attempting to dupe the masses and then reopen the gulags. Of course, this would be ridiculous, as it is also with the populist right. 5. The current rise in populism is new. As early as the 90s, Berlusconi ascended to government in Italy following massive corruption scandals that trashed support for the mainstream. This was in coalition with the also populist Lega Nord. In 2000, the FBO became a coalition partner in Austria. In 2002, the Front National got into the second round of the French elections. In the same year, Pim Fortein List formed a coalition in the Netherlands. Some of these parties have histories spanning over half a century. Populism is not a flash in the pan, and the current upsurge we are seeing is not a recent aberration, but has been a staple of Western democracies for quite some time, and, I would argue, a necessary component of a healthy democracy. Populist parties railing against the elite, standing for the common man and woman, not only provide an outlet for the electorate, signalling their discontent for the status quo and the enforcers thereof, but also alert the more established parties of their shortcomings and how they can better rectify themselves to meet the needs of the populace. This is not to say populism is always great and we should welcome it with open arms, assessing them uncritically and sycophantically. It is, however, to say that populists aren't always something to fear. Not everyone will agree with what they have to say, 
and that's good. But they're not going anywhere either, and in my opinion, that's good also. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please remember to press subscribe and click like. If you didn't, click dislike and tell me where I'm going wrong. Please do leave a comment. As always, huge thank you for my Patreons, and if it is within your means, please do consider donating. Thanks a lot for the support, and until next time.